Star Trek Picard is the most disappointing thing since Star Trek Discovery. What? You wanted something clever? It's the fucking truth. After we are done breaking and entering, would you like to join me in making Leland scream? Yum, yum. Please just, please evaluate the show on its merits. Ah! Everyone has worked so hard and given so much love to this thing. Shut the fuck up. This thing is being born of love. Please, please give it a chance. This is for him. Anyway, hey, it's me, Mr. Plinkett. I'm back, and I'm gonna talk about Star Trek Picard. I know these two fat clowns talked about it to death, so I'll try not to repeat too much. If I do, please email me and let me know at I don't give two shits at farts.net. Thank you, now hit it, Johnny! Star Trek Picard is neither Star Trek nor Picard. It's different, and it's not all good. Let me explain. When they first announced this show, when Picard came out of the doors, you know, the doors, and everybody clapped. Fucking what? Jean-Luc Picard is back. Sheer fucking hubris. You think you could just bust back in here and be entrusted with taking men and women into space? Don't you think I was watching The Hollow the other day along with everyone else in the galaxy? Should not have spoken in public. We were promised that it wasn't going to be another string you along, violent, disgusting, embarrassing trash fire like Star Trek Discovery. They lied, people died. We were told it would be a show exploring the doubtful character of Jean-Luc Picard. Your show changed my life. Without Star Trek, the next generation. I might not be here. And and that lies at the very center of what I have to tell you now. Jean-Luc Picard is back. You know, in his elderly senior years, living in retirement on his French vineyard. But then they realize that apparently trash sells. Just look at this garbage. They promised us that even though this would be a character study, he'd still have many adventures. Smaller, less epic, but still adventures. Maybe he'll enter a winemaking contest with an old adversary. Or maybe he could put on his Dixon Hill costume and figure out the mystery of who stole the ancient French statue. Surprise! It was Damon Globuck! Damon time traveled to 1700s France to hide 1,000 bars of gold-pressed latinum inside the statue in order to retrieve it at a future date where it's now increased in value for some reason. Oh, Picard finds this out and he's about to call the authorities, but... Turns out that the Damon needed it for his wife's ear cancer treatment. They share a laugh and a glass of wine. Or Picard could reconnect with this lady. You're definitely better than you think. Or this lady. Or this lady. Or this lady. Or this lady. I can assure you that I'm not given to casual relationships. Hey, maybe Deanna, Troy, and Riker come and visit Picard. Maybe Troy has a few too many glasses of wine, and then they all head down to the local French town festival. There, Troy pretends to be a carnival barker playing the guess my age, weight, or birth month game. Then she discovers the local mayor is hiding something, and it's not just his age. They investigate this and discover that he's planning to seize Picard's vineyard, and then bulldoze it in order to make room for a secret illegal wine synthesizing plant disguised as a bakery. He's a villain! Oh my god. Hey, maybe Picard wakes up one morning and discovers that he's in France, but in the 1940s, under the Nazi occupation. He's gotta help the French resistance. He falls in love with an elderly lady, and eventually they help break a code that helps win World War II. Then he realizes it was all a prank played by his old pal Q. Q says, Picard, you're getting a little lazy in your older years. I wanted to see if you still had it in ya. They share a laugh and a glass of wine. Hey, maybe we can have an episode about Picard's dog. 
He needs his anal glands expressed. So Picard calls Dr. Crusher to help. The dog is concerned that a doctor named Crusher will be pressing on his anal glands. Picard assures him she has gentle, loving hands to caress and don't squeeze too hard. Picard and Beverly talk about life and love over a glass of wine. She tells him that she's very embarrassed of Wesley's life choices. I freaking love this show. And that is a horrible sellout. We need a couple of things for good storytelling, um, which is, uh, you know, catastrophe. Of uh, course. Violence. Uh. Then maybe her and Picard reconnect in a sexy way. But then a time travel accident brings Jack Crusher back to life, but only for a week before he begins to slowly vanish. What does she do? Does she stay with Picard? Penny for your thoughts. Does she rekindle her love with her, her long dead husband? What a dilemma! So many smaller, fun, heartwarming, silly, Star Trek-like stories that could be to- Oh. Once these orchids have had it, there will still be 200 Romulan warships in We just got more discovery. Where's my data? More space violence. More dark, pointless garbage for bots to praise on social media. Ah, I'm sorry. Did I say bots? I meant people. Real people, not bots. Why would I say bots? I meant real people. Okay, hit it, Johnny. Number one, the living nightmare is over. For now. Well, let's recap this shit fest. Picard is old. Very, very old. Patrick Stewart is like 80, but he has the stamina of someone who is 137. I mean, just look at this spry 80-year-old. He's gone where no man has gone before, and he just keeps going. Hello, Sam. Hello, William Shatner, who's now really in to electric biking. He's on his 15th divorce. Ooh, and look at this. So Why not make Star Trek Kirk? It could be about him searching the galaxy for the greatest and best fitting space girdle of all. Let me just go and tell Bill about my idea. Oh, well, um, I guess I could tell CBS about my idea. Oh, alas, I digress. Let's grease this pig up. So Picard has spent decades feeling bad about how Data blew himself. What? Wait, sorry. Oh, oh. continues on to the next page. Blew himself up. Sorry, sorry about that. I mean, let's be honest, he did beam Picard out, but his sacrifice wasn't just to save Picard's life. He gave his life to save mine. It was more so that if Shinzon's ship fired, it'd kill everyone on the Enterprise. No one on the Enterprise will survive. So it wasn't just a you for me, self-destruct kind of situation. I mean, technically he did save Picard, but he also saved all of these people, too. But no one remembers that. And by no one, I mean the writers and producers of this stupid show. We've designed it so that if you're coming in cold with no knowledge of Star Trek, you're gonna be able to drop in and you should be able to catch up quickly. They didn't even watch Nemesis. I think if you're going to watch anything, um, watching... An intern watched it for them and just told them that the last time we saw Data, he saved Picard's life. The show is called Star Trek Picard. Whatever. The fact that he thought of Data as not a human being, but as a, a man nonetheless, is part of the reason why he is so haunted by Data's death, by Data's having sacrificed his life for Picard. We must select an officer to replace Data at Ops. Recommendations. So when we see Picard, we discover that he has dreams about Data every night. Because he's in love with him. He's so old. And he's got Romulan Tal Shiar housekeepers that like him. Because Picard tried to save Romulans. He needed Starfleet's help to get Romulans off Romulus. Because it was going to get destroyed by a supernova created by J.J. Abrams. He needed ships. Starfleet didn't want to spare any of their ships. They don't have a lot of them. 
and the Romulans don't have any ships to spare either. But who cares, the details aren't important. Barely anything from this Romulan evacuation plot really connects with anything else. I mean, it sort of does, but it's more of a setup or a backstory for a larger story about nothing. I guess the story is about the redemption of the worst actress in the world. I can't put anyone else in danger. I don't want anyone else to get hurt. Mom, I'm so scared. Who is it? I'm in here. I didn't call maintenance today. Oh. Okay, the second worst actress in the world. You see, what's really important on this show are the characters. Uh, the great, one-dimensional, I mean, depthful characters. Like, uh, Raffi. Uh, Raffi had a son who doesn't like her. Which we discover in one episode and, and then it's never brought up again. He doesn't forgive her at the end and decide to... Let her be a grandma to his his baby. And then Captain Rios. Captain Rios, um He lives on a starship. Then there's this character. And this character. He has a sword. And uh he wants to help Picard. Or he just really likes fucking cutting people with a sword. I guess he was mad at Picard because Picard left him when he was like five and then didn't come back till he was like like 20 or something. Hello? So he was really mad at first and then he wasn't mad because he thought, hey, this is a great opportunity to kill people with a sword. What a great character. And then there's this character. Oh. Oh, literally. Oh, that's what you think about when you see that character. Oh, and then there's, uh, Nerissa. Nerissa and Narek. Nerissa. She's pretty depthful. Let me peel away the layers of depthfulness to her character. Well, there's, there's evil. Uh, uh, I guess that's it. Anyway, let's move on. Number two, the story. Basic movie storytelling says that in a good script, no scene should be wasted. That's so interesting. No line of dialogue should be unmotivated. Bert tomato. Every action should push things along, explain something, or have some importance. Then we have something like Star Trek Picard. But wait, you say, Star Trek Picard is a TV show. No, it's essentially a 10 hour long movie. We pay admission to watch Star Trek Picard, and each episode runs into the next. So if it weren't for the stupid credits, it'd be one long movie. You know, our show, really the first three episodes are the first act, you know? Yeah. So you really, the pilot is really the first three episodes. Yeah. Um, Technically, it's a seven hour and 28 minute long movie when you remove the opening credits, the end credits, the previously on, and on the next Star Trek Picard. But anyway, none of that's really very important. So I don't know why I brought it up. So what's this movie show about? What's the message? Never again kill somebody just because it's what they deserve. <laughs> Ultimately, what I got from the first season was something so simple and childish, my cat could have wrote it. So the moral of the story was, um, mortality? I gave you a choice. Not being the destroyer was up to you. A choice? It always was. Or learning not to fear the unknown? Or Brexit? The wrong side of Brexit. Or illegal immigrants? Or Trump? Or Bitcoins? Or 9-11 was an inside job? Or build the wall? Or don't build the wall? Antifa? Or Medicare for all? Or LGBTQ rights? Factory farming is bad? Or Wall Street? Or old privileged whites are bad? Kids in cages? Capitalism, socialism, vegan rights, insurance companies are bad, motorcycle rights, pipelines, no pipelines, free range chickens, buy local and organic, stop big pharma, climate change, rainforest is burning, is Australia still burning, coronavirus, elder abuse, stock market, I don't know, something. The lesson that I learned was to fucking fear people that were different than me and that gays are psychopaths. Was that what they were going for? If so, they succeeded. Good job. Well, I, I, I think it is. Anyway, so Data saved Picard. So Picard tried to save Soji. 
Not save her in a physical sense, but I guess save her, quote, humanity? Make her realize that she could be something more, and that she shouldn't give in to fear. Sutra was pushing fear, and Soji was buying it. It was kind of like how people gave in to the fear of androids because it was totally reasonable to do so. Dude creeps me out. Hey, he can hear you. I mean, they blew up an entire planet, killing 93,000 people. And they all seem totally gung-ho for killing all life in the universe. What's not to be scared of? Picard pleaded with Soji to make the choice to not allow the robotic space octopus from a dimensional asshole to kill everyone in the universe. I guess she learned something? Because Picard made a sacrifice? I have something I want to give you and your people. My life. Picard out. Flying a ship up into space and making copies of it. All the while he was having conveniently timed brain trauma. Guess it's kind of scary that Soji even considered that shit for a moment. Don't let the Romulans turn you into the monsters they fear. Oh, hum. Come on and join the crew! Then at the end we learn that Data is just like the audience. He just wants to die. When you leave, I would be profoundly grateful if you terminated my consciousness. And then Picard's brain disease acts up and kills him at the right exact dramatic moment. Then I guess they make a robot version of him. I'm skipping right to the end. From a convenient golem android body that was ready to be imprinted with memory engrams. Is it poetic irony that Picard ultimately becomes an android? The race he fought so hard to... Or wait, that was the Romulans. Uh, I did try to save the Romulans before, kind of. He did turn into a Romulan to try and reunite them with the Vulcans. But as far as androids go, Picard only really liked Data. I find myself in complete agreement with that assessment of the situation, sir. And he didn't know about these Manson cult freaks until the end. But, uh, so now he's an android. But he's still old, but he's like exactly the same. You haven't made me immortal. And they made him mortal, too. We designed a cellular homeostasis algorithm that should give you okay. more or less the same number of years you would have expected without the brain condition. And he's got none of the advantages that an android has. So he's still old. Like exactly the same age? Did they make it so that he'll get winded going up three steps too? Did they make his fucking knees and back hurt him as well? make him so goddamn tired? What about his enlarged prostate? His housekeepers jokingly call him P-Card. Cause he urinates all night long! Agnes, did you shrink his prostate? Did you kill his shingles virus? Like you killed Bruce Maddox? Anyway... And Zombie Picard is also programmed to die as well. Why? I guess he doesn't want to be immortal. Maybe they could have asked him all these questions. Do you want a giant cock? I wouldn't have minded. Another ten? Do you want to secure your erectile dysfunction? Do you want better knees? You want some Botox? But anyway, remember when Troy pointlessly mentioned how her son had a silicon-based brain disease? It's a silicon-based virus. It's very rare, and in theory, completely curable. That only an android could have cured? I mean, you could have had Dr. Sung use his massive intelligence to figure out a cure for Picard's brain disease. You know, by combining human therapeutics with android ones. This new methodology would have been a wonderful healing tool for the humans and synths, and open a new chapter in their coexistence. Then Picard wouldn't be a zombie android clone for season two. Y you eh, whatever. Jesus, you'd think Troy's comments were at least a setup for something. Fuck this show. Pizza's ready! Um, it's a mess. I a hundred percent agree with you. Uh. Number three, the end is the beginning. So now that this shit show is finally done, and we have answers to all the quote mysteries that were presented, we can finally reverse engineer this train wreck. So let's jump from the ending back to the beginning because now we can. Without doubt, Daj and Soji are the central point of this show. They, or her, are the reason for all the conflict that make this plot limp along. So basically, we start off the show with this scene. Ugh. 
By finishing the season of the show, we understand that the Jatvaj want one and only crucial piece of information. Gotta kill the synths. Where is that synth homeworld? Apparently that's where all the synths are in the galaxy. So then the Bromulans can find it and carpet bomb it. But wait, does this robotic evil octopus get upset by the existence of synths made by other races too? Applying a variant of the Drake equation, it would probably result in maybe a hundred or a thousand other races having made androids or currently making them. Fuck, maybe a million other races. The galaxy is a very big place. Would carpet bombing Sung Jr.'s little planet really stop this space octopus? What exactly is the range of a space octopus? Like a quadrant? Or, or the galaxy? Or the universe? Cloud composition, Mr. Spock. 12 power energy field. 12 power. Thanks, Spock. Thanks for telling us just how big the V'ger cloud is. It helps me to understand the threat. That measures 12 power energy? Thanks, sex pervert. Thousands of starships couldn't generate that much. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Agnes just said that no one makes sense anymore. No one makes sense anymore of any kind. It's a violation of galactic treaty. It's a violation of galactic treaty. It's a violation of galactic treaty. Yeah, okay. So there's a treaty that applies to the whole galaxy? Galactic treaty. I'm sure everyone will abide by that. You know, because Earth's androids went nuts, blew up Mars. I'm sure the Glorgon Empire 30,000 light years away that use androids to mine their spaceship fuel will be happy to stop making androids. Unacceptable risk. You know, because Galactic Treaty. It's a violation of Galactic Treaty. Just say Galactic Treaty. Galactic Treaty. Who signed it? Galactic Treaty. Where does it extend to? Galactic Treaty. Just don't think about it. Galactic Treaty. Galactic Treaty. Don't think about it. It's a Galactic Treaty. Galactic Treaty. It's a treaty that's galactic. In nature. Galactic Treaty. It applies to the galaxy. Galactic Treaty. And it's a treaty. So nobody makes sense anymore. Galactic Treaty. Focus your attention on one plot. This one. Don't think about logic. I failed you all. Nobody makes androids anymore. It's nobody. A violation of Galactic Treaty. Nobody, 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 because there's a Galactic Treaty. What, what if there's like a hospital somewhere, like on a planet in the Federation where they have, they have android, like doctors, kind of like EMHs, you know? The Federation comes in and they're like, we have this like, like giant hospital with like a million patients in it and, and we have we have 10,000 androids that see to their care because they have just like like long-term illness can we still have our androids now now galactic treaty shut the fuck up galactic treaty galactic treaty galactic treaty can't have androids because mars's atmosphere exploded okay well i mean all these patients are gonna die there's like a million patients that are gonna die Galactic, Galactic treaty. treaty. But I digress. Let's not think too much. We only need our brains for this tear-jerking scene at the end of the season. Data says he loves butterflies. Keep quiet and stay subscribed to CBS All App. So anyway, they need this one piece of information from Dodge or Soji. Forget which one is which. Now in this scene, the ultra-secret Romulan Jat Vash used the method that works the best in the spy business. Brute force. While seemingly having an overwhelming advantage, they beam into Dodge's apartment, kill her boyfriend with a knife, then literally grab her and yell at her. Where are the rest of you? Where are you from? These questions totally confuse her as it should. So their next step is to, quote, knock her out. Knock her out. Not by stunning her, or putting her in a stasis field or a force field or even transporting her out of the room, but by putting a bag over her head. Cause you know, androids need to breathe. Can he breathe underwater? What? Data doesn't breathe. But I, I don't know, I guess she's a human android. And they didn't really put a bag over her head so that they didn't have to do a face replacement on the stunt person doing all the fight choreography. That's not why. Why would you say that? Romulans even showed up with the knowledge that she could, quote, activate at any moment and kill them all. So they went about this in the worst way possible. And 
and I guess nobody came looking for where this guy went, huh? Remember when the Romulans kidnapped Jordy LaForge and turned him into a spy? What'd they do? Well, they surprised him. Oh! Beamed him aboard, strapped him to a chair. They even sent a lookalike of him to his conference. Romulans are good at the spy game. It's a fake. And the torture game. They didn't beam onto Geordi's shuttlecraft in biker costumes and beat the shit out of them, and then go back and meticulously clean up their mess. They could have waited until she was alone, beamed her into a holding cell with a level 10 force field, and very slowly attempted to get the information from her. Now we'll have our private talk. But they chose this method instead. How intriguing, how mysterious. It's just like a born Identity movie. Can I just mention though? That her boyfriend really needs to see a dermatologist? Ew. Later in the show, Captain Rios tells us of another incident with the Tal Shiar or Jat Vash or whatever. And with the synths that happened years before this. And this was at the direction of Commodore O even. The fucking leader of the Jat Vash. Apparently two synthetics on a tiny spaceship left their magical flower disco planet and met up with Rios and his Federation starship, the Ibn Majid Majid. So they wouldn't blow up the Ibn Majid. For no reason at all. And one of the androids was named Beautiful Flower. Beautiful Flower. And the other one looked like Soji. Her and her sister were like earlier versions of Soji. So anyway... I guess the two synthetics were being totally diplomatic and everything was going great. Until Commodore O told Captain Vandermeer to kill them both. And of course he does it without questioning anything. A few hours later, Alonzo Vandermeer kills them both in cold blood. But wait. O didn't care where they came from? Being a super secret spy, she didn't tell Captain Vandermeer to, you know, court them diplomatically, line them and dine them. Maybe ask them casually where they're from. I mean, they presented themselves with an olive branch and didn't seem too shy. Why just instantly have them murdered? Takes them both out with two quick pops on the phaser. Why? If your goal is to find their home planet, find more of them. What did they do with their little spaceship they came on? Tiny ship. Unknown design. Even after you murdered them, O could have said, Vandermeer. Beam over to their little spaceship and download their flight logs. See where they've been and where they came from. You know, information is currency in the secret spy business, right? But I guess that gave Rios his backstory as to why he's so moody and dark. Space Jim Morrison needs to grow a pair. Riker didn't seem bothered at all that him and his old captain killed their entire crew on accident. Look at him playing his trombone, laughing. Hosting card games, being a total slut. I mean, come on, Rios, get over it. What the fuck is wrong with you? This also leads to a bit of information that these two androids or synths or whatever were created by Bruce Maddox and Sung Jr., the son of Noonie and Sung we never know he had. Presumably, these androids were made on the disco planet, right? Force. Maddox left Earth right after the ban. No one was able to find him for 14 years. Maybe he went to this planet with the two red moons. And resumed his work creating synthetic life forms. But in episode three, when we meet Maddox, he says the Tal Shiar destroyed his lab. When the Tal Shiar came for me, blew up my lab. He says they used a molecular solvent to destroy the entire lab. They used some kind of molecular solvent to destroy the entire facility. There was literally nothing left. Okay, so is this a different lab than the one on the disco planet? These were Maddox's old quarters. Yes. Was it also a different lab than the one where him and Agnes were baking cookies? I assume that was at the Daystrom Institute. Remember, Agnes said that's where the synths were created that destroyed Mars. The androids that destroyed Mars came from this lab. But if his lab was destroyed, there's no evidence of that. Everything looks fine to me. Which lab? Where was that at? So Maddox, in addition to working with Sung Jr. on the disco planet when he was in hiding, also had another robotics lab somewhere else besides Daystrom? But you see, Soji was created 37 months ago. Probable age, 37 months. 
which is like what three years probable 37 age, months 36 months is three years probable age 37 months so yeah three years and, and one month roughly probable age 30 37 months probable age 37 months 30 okay age, 37 months. fucking got it probable age you could stop Probable scanning age. everything in the room now. Months. Months. It's gonna come up 37 months. Probable age, 37 months. The next thing you scan, it's gonna say 37 months. Go ahead, scan it. It's gonna say 37 months. Okay, I got it. Why does she still have all this childhood shit? Why does she still have a teddy bear from when she was four? So Maddox made her three years ago on the disco planet with other children of Data. Because they made twins from one of Data's neurons. As Agnes explains. His theory was that Data's entire code, even his memories, could be reconstituted from a single positronic neuron. So Maddox was there, he was here, and he was at a lab that was destroyed by the Tal Shiar or the Jat Vash or the whatever. Jesus, this guy really gets around. How hard would it be to just follow him around in a cloaked ship? Let him lead you to the robot planet. He's apparently not that hard to find. Bruce, this is so unexpected. Bruce Maddox is on free cloud. Free cloud, yes, of course. Maybe do that instead of orchestrating a synth band by creating a giant terrorist attack. The Jat Vash are terrible spies. But wait, there's more. After her boyfriend is killed, and after she killed the Romulan assassins, Dodge flees her apartment. Imagine if she had just called the cops or whatever authority figures would come to her aid. She'd be like, look, why didn't they beam up the bodies? Whoever's doing the beaming, why didn't they beam up the bodies? Take off their biker helmets. Oh my god, they're Romulans! Call Starfleet. Call an emergency meeting of the Federation Council. Romulans are doing secret spy shit on Earth. Get their gear and analyze it. Get your best tech guy in here. What? They made secret subspace calls to Commodore O? But instead she flees. Like true film noir. I mean, Star Trek. I guess she fled because the whole incident really spooked her. But she also fled because she saw a vision of Picard. Now why did she see a vision of Picard? Was it just because the plot needed them to meet up? Was it because her brain was made from Data's positrons? And Data loved Picard? I never knew what a friend was until I met Geordi. He spoke to me as though I were human. It's a life, Data. It can't be activated and deactivated simply. Data, you are the key to this entire mystery, and you have done nothing but block my every attempt to solve it. Why are you fighting me? He treated me no differently from anyone else. Data is not capable of the emotions which you're assigning him. He accepted me for what I am. By my calculations, we no longer have sufficient momentum to clear the debris field. Thank you, Mr. Data. And that I have learned is friendship. I call it Ode to Spot. Felis Catus is your taxonomic nomen. Wouldn't she also see this, though? Or this? Or this? Or this, or this, or this, or this, or this? You wanted me? I guess I'm just not understanding why she saw Picard. Cause mystery! Many aspects of this situation are puzzling to me. I guess when she calls her mother, she tells her to go back to Picard. You have to go back to Picard. No, no, it's too dangerous. And Dodge is like, I never said I saw Picard. How'd you know that? Now clearly this wasn't a real mother, or even a real person, just some kind of computer program. But how'd that computer program know? Is Dodge just talking to herself? Did Bruce Maddox hardwire Dodge's brain to run to Picard for help if she ever got activated? I kept seeing your face. Me? If so, why Picard? Because Picard loves Data? Maddox met Picard like 40 years ago and he was his adversary. I don't understand the connection. Oh, it's because it had to happen in the TV show. She's activated. She's activated. How about if Dodge ever got activated, her brain is hardwired to return to the home planet for a debriefing. Do you remember when Noonie and Soong put that hidden program in Data and Laura's brains to return to him if he ever activated it remotely? Data turned into a super badass and hijacked the Enterprise in like two minutes. Enter code. 
1734673214764673297767643 Charlie 32789777643 Tango 732 Victor 7317888732476789764376 Lock Establish That was awesome I order you to stop Computer begin scan phase Oh wait why is she programmed to be, quote, activated at all? Why? I guess it's for self-defense, in case the Tal Shiar tries to kill her. Why? You see, Maddox says he sent Soji and Dodge out into the galaxy to find out the real reason behind the synth ban. The same reason I sent her sister to Earth. I'll tell you the real reason. It's cause Synths went crazy and blew up Mars. But he thinks there's something more sinister. They're hiding something. <laughs> Who? I don't know. Like maybe something about a robotic space octopus? Or he's not quite sure. Or lies upon lies. Why would he think there's anything more to it? I think the Federation are involved. Where's the evidence of that? That's what I so he sends Dodge to Earth and Soji to the Borg Cube. Not the captured Borg Cube. Both with implanted fake backstories. My question is, all these androids all know that they're androids and live on a little commune. Soji and Dodge appear to be some of the first androids that look and feel human. You know, like no gold skin or, or fake robot gold eyes like Data had. I mean, there's a couple other ones there, but but not a lot. So if his goal was to have them discover the secret reason behind the ban, why essentially blindfold them with these fake memories? Why not implicitly tell them to go out and act like you're a cybernetic scientist and use your skills as a secret android to find out information? Cause mystery box. Or I mean, since you sent Soji to the Borg cube, clearly you suspect Romulan involvement. Why not make a Romulan android? And infiltrate the Jat Vash to get information. It makes more sense than making an android that looks like a terrible actress. I mean, a naive young woman. Romulans are into drama. You see, this whole situation with the space octopus and the synth ban and the Jat Vash, etc. Could all have been handled simply, logically, and straightforward. But if you, as a writer, dip your knife into a jar filled with pointless mystery, slather it all over, smear it all out all over every episode, it all becomes vague and confusing, and it looks more complicated than it really is. This kind of trick will work on the weak-minded. You see, someone once said a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. If your story goes like this without any real or logical reason... There are lies upon lies. I mean, there's nothing wrong with some twists and turns. How do you know that? As long as they make sense. Why do you need me? If nothing makes sense, then it all boils down to what it really is. Terrible, misleading, and awful storytelling. Just listen to some of these lines. I came because the same lightning that got me out of there alive led me here. Why? These are some real vague humdingers. I do think you're full of secrets. Or is that a secret? Now might be a good time to reveal the secret plan. Romulans love secrets. The only reliable keepers of secrets. But it's a bit redundant. You could put the word secret in front of almost any aspect of Romulan culture. Mm, secret plan -y. A secret? To keep a secret so profound and terrible. Is everything Romulans do a secret? Happy secret. Secret Romulan assassins are operating on Earth. Everyone is hiding something. Whether they know it or not. Her lies upon lies. You think everyone's hiding something? You may be right. Do you know how? No. Look, Daja's sister is in grave danger. She may already be dead. You see, my friends, there are many plot threads in this stupid fucking show. Most of these threads go nowhere, 
or fall out when they're pulled on, or vanish once they happen, never to be thought of again. And this is when I go back to just the very first episode. If I did all 10 episodes, we'd be here until the coronavirus pandemic is over. So I can't and won't question every decision, every plot point, every moment, every line of dialogue, because we'll all go crazy. Has the machine given up the location of its fellow abominations? One thing though is very clear. This show's producers, let's call them the four embarrassing horse people of the apocalypse. Kurtzman, Goldsman, Bayer, and Shaban. They created this show with one goal in mind to make a show that's the worst show ever. It's a story about emotion and life and what it does to you and how things don't always turn out the way you, you are hoping they will and what do you do about it once you realize that. There's a lot of emotion we were trying to get across. It's always been about hope and equality and inclusion. And I've heard a lot of women say, oh my God, he's like the sexiest captain. That's, you know, a, a fact. But also to keep you subscribed to get the dumb bots to this teary-eyed moment. It's a beautiful moment. It's a really beautifully written scene about why he wants to die. Much like Discovery shoveled junk down your throat to get you to this teary-eyed moment too. It's very easy to trick stupid emotional people but it's hard to please a truly intelligent audience. If you want to watch an actual smart show about synths, watch Westworld. Because this shit's a fucking joke. An unmitigated disaster. Number four, let's wade through this jacuzzi filled with diarrhea. Now I understand that a lot of you watching this review may not have actually seen Star Trek Picard. So I'll go through it quickly. Very quickly. But I don't have time to explain all the Star Trek stuff, so if you're a little confused, I'm sorry. Go read a book or something. These two people who love him very dearly are able to point out to him that in dealing with Soji, he's never been a father before, and he's really bad at it. And he's treating Soji like a, another officer on his ship, and he's no longer the captain, and she doesn't work for him, and... This isn't just a very long drought, is it, Father? Or get a life. The Romulans and the synth band. Okay, so the Romulan son is going to go supernova. Romulans have traditionally been the bad guys, so most of the galaxy said good riddance. If the point has not yet been made clearly, Commander, let me make it again. Romulan warships do not enter Federation space unless they are prepared to do battle. But Picard says, hey, let's help him. So he does help. He takes a bunch of Romulans to a dusty Wild West planet. And I guess a, a first wave of of evacuations? Yes, of course. But in three days, I have to be in Central Station to meet the next convoy. Because then they later say that they're building more ships for the evacuation on Utopia Planitia. So I guess Picard did it once. So I guess there's a second he needed to do it again. Evacuation is maybe a third time. time. What will this mean for our mission? Will it continue? Of course, it must because Picard befriends some Romulan warrior nuns that we never see again, and also a kid for no reason at all. Later, when the kid is all grown up, he pledges his sword to Picard's mission, which means he does nothing but murder people pointlessly. Then he abandons Picard for another hopeless cause, which is to protect Hugh. I guess he really likes hopeless causes. Hopeless causes means he gets to murder people with the sword. But wait, Picard already had ultra-efficient assassins that vowed to protect him. Oh. I guess they stayed home to keep an eye on the grapes. No one but the Talsiar could ever protect you against the Talsiar. She's not wrong. But you have to stay here with her. The grapes are far more in need of protection than I am. And it's less than a month to the harvest. Why wouldn't they? Oh, fuck it. But then since attack Mars at the worst possible time and blow up the shipyards building ships that are meant for a Romulan evacuation. They hack the brain of this robot synth right here, and he tells all the other synths to kill everyone and blow up everything. This whole plan was done by the secret half-Vulcan, half-Romulan spy, Commodore O, who somehow is the head of Starfleet security. She burrows into Starfleet, rises through the ranks, and becomes head of security. What, they don't vet people in the 24th century? The logical course is that I transport aboard your ship and begin the negotiations. What? 
by. Also, after so much time, Picard decides that this is the crusade he must go on, to save Romulans. What the hell was he doing when Starfleet put the stamp of approval on slavery? Now, sooner or later, this man, or others like him, will succeed in replicating commander data. Not if we use synthetic labor. All synthetic life forms are banned throughout the Federation effective immediately. Now, the decision you reach here today will determine how we will regard this creation of our genius. It will reveal the kind of a people we are, what he is destined to be. It will reach far beyond this courtroom and this one android. It could significantly redefine the boundaries of personal liberty and freedom, expanding them for some, savagely curtailing them for others. The androids that destroyed Mars came from this lab. Are you prepared to condemn him and all who come after him to servitude and slavery? Not if we use synthetic labor. He was really quite impassioned about it before. So why did the Jatvas choose this particular point in time for their Mars attack? Do they even know about the hidden synth disco planet yet? Or that it had the ability to build a space laser to let in the evil robot octopus? Is the robot octopus really such a threat that it needs to be let into our universe via a device that we build for it? It would seem that framing synths for mass murder would rock the boat, so to speak. Maybe even get the attention of the evil robot space octopus. Why not just quietly look for the secret synth planet? It wasn't too hard for our heroes to find Bruce Maddox. I found Maddox. He's literally sitting in a public place. This lady found him too. This is so unexpected. The lady that looks like Deanna Troy. But wait, why not just use your super secret spy agencies to wipe synths out? Why frame synths for murder when you can just hack into their brains and literally make them kill themselves? Why instead of attacking the Mars Utopia Planitia shipyards, they didn't just attack each other? Tell the synths via a robot communication into their brains that they should shoot each other. You know, like they did on Westworld? So doing this big, horrendous 9-11 style attack created the synth ban. Wouldn't that just force some synths into hiding, which would make your job more difficult? Which is exactly what happened? Did the octopus not care about the mindless slave synths? Also, I mean, I know the Romulans are by nature secretive, but given the stakes, why not share this information about the evil space octopus with the Federation? Be like, hey guys, this terrible fucking thing could happen if we all make a bunch of synths. How about we stop doing that? Just look for yourselves, okay? There's this electrical ring on this planet. And maybe you could kind of build a device that touches the laser instead of grabbing it by your hands, which, which makes you want to claw your fucking eyes out or shoot yourself in the head. Some kind of Starfleet technical genius could figure out how to download the information that's in this electrical ring. You know, because grabbing it is really fucking dangerous. Hmm. I wonder how it works. Why don't you try it and find out? I'd like to know a little bit more about it before I try it. I don't know. I could do anything else in this universe. Also, Data was fairly well known during his heyday. You're the android. Even this Romulan knew about him, as did his non-existent Romulan cyberneticist friends. Have you never noticed the complete absence of any form of artificial life in Romulan culture? I know a host of Romulan cyberneticists that would love to be this close to you. We don't have androids or AIs. We don't study cybernetics. You'd think the Jat Vash would have been on the case to blow up Data ASAP and murder Dr. Nooney and Soong. So he stops making so many Datas and robot wives. You know, given that the Jat Vash was around for like a thousand years or whatever. We, the Jat Vash, were born. For hundreds of years since, we have worked in shadow to prevent a second coming. And their sole purpose in life was to squash synthetic life? Data was floating around for 25 years. Also, someone warned Harry Mudd. Look out, robot ladies, you're in trouble. Also, look out, robot guy. And watch your back, Discovery, robot lady. Oh, I guess she died, right? She got infected by like a, a evil nano AI robot or something. And she fucking killed herself, or you know, Michael Burnham was trying to save her so she didn't kill herself. And, well, whatever. Where do we begin? On the world the humans, 
called Mars. Why? 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 What? What the hell are you talking about? I don't yet fully understand all of it. So the Ramans or the Jatvash or whatever decide that they should have the synths attack Mars during the evacuation of their homeworld. You know, when their son is about to go supernova, which will do nothing but disrupt the rescue process. Rafi, why would the Romulans attack a fleet built expressly to rescue them? I can't answer that. Why not attack a different location where synths are being used as slave labor? Like a dilithium mine, factory making medical equipment, or or on Earth in a restaurant, or somewhere else other than the place that's building ships for your fucking rescue evacuation? Also, why is it up to the Federation to build ships? Don't the Romulans have shipyards? Can't they build ships too? They're not totally helpless, you know. Or pull off the old Mars attack after every Romulan is safely accounted for and on other planets. There didn't seem to be a rush. Was there any indication that the robot space octopus's attack was imminent? I know the lady called the prophecy the news, but was there a specific date? I don't recall one. Maybe it was in these vague tarot cards. So because of the attack on Mars, Picard can no longer help the Romulans a second time. I failed you all. Which makes them all mad at Picard because he had nothing to do with since attacking Mars. They did. The Romulans were behind the attack on Mars. <sighs> mm, I guess he tried, but he didn't try hard enough. That is not so. Because he could literally do nothing. And after a while, none of this Romulan relocation shit matters anymore. Because the Romulans are also working on the Borg Reclamation Site. So in addition to the stress of being space refugees and having two secret organizations trying to stop a galactic apocalypse, the Romulans have also converted a damaged offline Borg cube into some kind of research laboratory or hospital. Now this particular Borg cube, quote, broke when it tried to assimilate this lady. A Jat Vosh lady who touched a magical electric ring that foretold of the dangers of having androids. I guess the danger is a rapid collection of stock footage images and a 60-year-old public domain film of a fox decomposing. I saw that when I was in grade school. Oh my god, it's so scary. I'm surprised they didn't put this in there. Or footage from Night of the Living Dead. Oh wait, they did. Oh my god, how embarrassing. So that's what motivates the Jad Vash, the scary images of a worth exploding that's narrated by Siri. An alliance of synthetic life. Synthetic life. Watching you. Waiting for your signal. Summon us and we will come. Summon us. You will have our protection. Oh my god, I gotta claw my eyes out now. I'm so fucking scared. Couldn't this just be a prank? I'll take it for face value though. I'm just gonna kill myself or claw my eyes out. Now I guess only the strongest minds can handle this imagery. It's kind of like when Sauron was forced to watch a bunch of disturbing shit when he was younger, which made him want to go into the Nexus, as seen in this cut sequence from Star Trek Generations. You proved to me that all this ultraviolence and killing is wrong! But, as it turns out, this electricity ring wasn't meant for people at all. It was meant for androids. Fascinating. It was to tell androids what a space octopus would do to people if those people that made the androids made them in the first place? What? It's like androids are great, kill all the organics. What a twist! So what's the purpose of this Borg Reclamation project anyway? At first, it's a little confusing. At second, it's a little confusing. Finally, at third, it's totally pointless and confusing. It looks to be a general philanthropic endeavor. In fact, a former Borg and human is in charge. He's the director of a Romulan project that's top secret. I would never have believed that assimilation could be undone on this scale. And by Romulans, no less. I guess it's not top secret because it's sort of in cooperation with the Federation. Access is for scientific research only. And maybe other worlds too? 
We see all kinds of people working on this thing. Humans, Andorians, the Irish. What? I'll take you home again, Kathleen. Picard is able to just beam over because he got diplomatic credentials from this lady. So I guess there definitely is some kind of Federation involvement. But whenever we see the Borg Cube, it's always accompanied by spooky music. And we only see hundreds of Romulan ships. So remember when the Federation hated and mistrusted the Romulans so much that they didn't want to save their species? The Romulans were our enemies, and we tried to help them for as long as we could. You'd think they'd insist on having a few starships floating around this Borg project. You know, because it's not wise to leave your mortal enemy all alone with super sophisticated alien technology that once belonged to your other mortal enemy? You know, just in case. Oh my god, they're up to no good! Who would have thought? They're profiting from extracted Borg tech. There's nothing very Romulan about this place at all. Apart from the current owners. And the profits you extract from the exploitation of Borg technology. And the profits you extract from a dead race? Property that's not yours? What? Sounds like some kind of Prime Directive violation. Why is the Federation any part of this? Who would have thought that the Romulans were up to no good? Maybe I agree with Admiral Fuckface and the evil Starfleet's decision not to want to save this awful race. I mean, they're doing shady things. They killed 19,000 people in an attack to frame synths. Uh, they're all pretty fucking ungrateful to Captain Picard for saving all their lives. I guess this nun's okay. And Picard's housekeepers are all right, I guess. But shit. Emerald Fuckface might have a point. Shut the fuck up. These people really are all sneaky and terrible. It's just that growing up in the sect, they're taught to always tell the truth. And that's kind of the difference between him and every other Romulan. I'm learning to become a racist by watching this show. Thanks, Alex Kurtzman. So while it would seem that this Borg Cube situation would be some kind of Romulan plot, story-wise, it was really just there so Narek and Nerissa could slowly trick Soji into telling them where the synth home planet was. But then eventually Seven of Nine shows up for no reason, takes over the Borg cube, gets really mad when Nerissa kills all the Borgs, and then the cube is pulled down to the planet by a giant space flower, where it just sits there. Then Seven of Nine sits around and does nothing, but I guess to have a cliched action cat fight with Nerissa. Gosh, it's 2020, aren't we past, quote, girl fights as a society yet? Jesus, what is this, 1990? What a bitch. Bitch! I can read your every move. And one of the great strengths of Star Trek is diversity and powerful women. It just comes naturally to this universe. It's all about the optimism that you can find when you think about humans, which sometimes can be tricky to get to, but in the context of this universe, you're just optimistic. That aspirational side of it has always been amazing. I just put a phaser to my head and get it over with. I guess she was mad that Nerissa killed Hugh, which is why they I fought. This, to live for. this is for Hugh. Although I'm not sure how she knew that. Maybe somebody told her, maybe the psycho guy told her with the swords. I honestly think they forgot to shoot a scene where she was told that. I mean, clearly this line was added later in post. This is for you. Just watch Seven of Nine's mouth when she begins her line. This is for you. So I guess her being angry about Hugh dying gave her motivation for murdering Nerissa too? Did Seven of Nine even know Hugh? That was a different show! I guess she learned a lesson at the end because she tells Rios that killing people for revenge is bad. Never again kill somebody just because it's what they deserve. Thanks, I learned that in sixth grade! So then when Seven of Nine kicks Nerissa off a cliff, letting her fall to her death, 
She's killing off another either former or potential future lover. You know, you're rather pretty. She'll have to be lesbian with the elderly drug addict. Wasn't Seven of Nine lovers with Chakotay? And other men on Voyager 2? And Raffi had a son. So, I guess being gay really is a choice. Just like all those Christian pastors told me. Or maybe when women reach a certain age, they just switch to lesbian. Hmm. I always thought it was the way you were born. Gosh, this show is teaching me so many things. Like being gay is a choice. And also to fear and hate people who aren't like me. But wait, maybe they're bisexual or pansexual. Maybe mostly everyone is bisexual in the future. Certainly Wesley was. He was in love with Ashley Judd and this creepy old guy. I've waited a long time for this moment, Wesley. And Riker fell in love with a person with no gender at all. Commander, there are no he's or she's in a species without gender. Maybe it's like a human evolution thing, you know? Two, three hundred years from now, I'm into genderless creatures. Now, when I turn 50, like seven of nine, I'm gonna fall in love with an elderly black and lady. Then, and then uh, seven of nine's done with that. Maybe she's gonna go bang Rios. As, as long as nobody is into kids. As long as the evolutionary process doesn't go that way, I'm all right with all of this. You got it? I mean, things could have gone real bad when Picard was trapped in that elevator. I'm sorry if this is really fucked up. So you know what? I'm gonna propose a challenge to Kurtzman, Shabon, Beyer, and Goldsman, or whoever's working on season two. Here we go, ready? Make Picard gay! You're a cutie full of charm. Do it, you fucking pussies. Do it. I double dog dare you. I know he's like an android now, but he's a humanish android. Everything works. Like Soji was, was fucking Narek, so I mean, it's not like Data. Even though Data was fully functional, but these, these new human androids can fuck. So make Picard gay. Bring in Ian McKellen and have him and Patrick Stewart be super gay. I have ideas. I could totally think of another use for a bottle of Chateau Picard. Don't be passive progressive like Disney and make pointless lesser characters gay. No one gives two shits if Seven of Nine is a lesbian. Or these guys, or this character. Fucking good for them. Go for the fucking gold. Make your main character gay. I dare you. Do it. Make Captain Picard gay. You fucking cowards. Or as someone might say, make it so gay. Engage. Picard, Synths, and the Doomsday Scenario. So our last chunk of the show deals with Picard and the storyline with Soji, Daj, and Data. And Picard's ultimate fate to pointlessly become an android zombie clone. Now this felt slapped on, but I don't think it was. If you look closely, it's predicted in the opening credit sequence. We see the two Data positrons and they slowly turn into a DNA strand, and then start to form Picard's eyeball, and then finally construct Picard's head. He's broken down, dies, and is resurrected. He's the real space Jesus. Take that, Darth Vader, you fucking fraud. Anyway, Soji and Dodge are twin sisters because they have to clone synths from DNA in pairs. We see lots of twins on the space hippie planet. We meet Sutra, the sister of Jana, who was the synth that Rio's former captain murdered. I guess this is why she's a bit pissy and doesn't like people. Yeah, it makes sense. So Maddox's plan to send out Daj and Soji does indeed attract unwanted attention. I warned him that this plan might draw unwanted attention. What a plan! Sutra convinces Soji that organics are bad and that she should eradicate all life in the universe so that these synths can live in peace. Soji eventually agrees and says, sure, why not? Robot space octopus, let's do it. Then all plot lines finally converge. 
Our heroes put a bomb in a soccer ball in a bungled attempt to blow up the tower about to shoot a blue laser into the sky that will let in a robotic space octopus through an interdimensional asshole. Earlier, Picard persuaded Admiral Potty Mouth Fuckface to send a fleet to the robot planet, which eventually she does, and it's led for no reason at all by Riker, who looks like he ate a few too many pizzas. He doesn't even fit in the captain's chair. He's got to lean on one side because he's got hemorrhoids. Anyway, when he addresses the Romulans, he says he's acting Captain William Riker. Acting Captain Will Riker in command of the USS Zheng He. Why did he have to say acting captain to her? I guess he's got to be all formal and by the rules, you know, because he's not still officially in Starfleet or he's on reserve or something. He's got to be sure to tell the Romulan fleet that he's acting captain. They don't even know what that means. It sounds like he's... he doesn't know what he's doing. He's acting captain. It's like I'm... I'm intern captain. Stand down, Romulan war fleet. I'm... I'm... I'm the acting captain. I'm not even a real one. That'll get you shaking in your Romulan space boots. Conversely, out of 10 million Romulan ships, why does Commodore O have to be in command? Why does she even answer the view screen? General, their flagship is hailing us. This totally blows her cover and she's exposed as a spy. General or Commodore or whatever you're calling yourself. She probably spent decades working up to the head of Starfleet security. Why not let somebody else talk while she hides in the bathroom? You know, just in case. Because Riker immediately calls her out on it. Why not let this guy talk? Anyway, Riker tells her he's on the bridge of the toughest, fastest, most powerful ship Starfleet has ever put into service. Looks to me he's on the bridge of a recycled set from Star Trek Discovery. But anyway, his flagship is the same ship as all the other ships. Jesus Christ, how lazy is this show? I mean, they made one CGI model and copy-pasted it. I know this is another nitpick, but I don't care. Starfleet is not a bunch of F-18 fighter jets. It's an exploratory navy, essentially. I mean, back in the original series, they had nothing but the Constitution-class ships, really. I mean, I get it, they had to build models and could probably only afford to build one. But even when they were still doing Star Trek with physical models, they understood the need for different types and classes of starships. Starfleet wasn't a uniformed war armada or an attack fleet. Huge fleet movements weren't very common because the ships were spread out all over the galaxy. You know, seeking out new life and new civilizations. Some ships were science vessels, research ships, escorts, ships made for diplomatic missions, ships made to tow other ships. It's like a real navy, which is why in the Dominion War you have a whole mess of different ships involved in fleet actions. Certainly, Miranda-class ships weren't meant for war. I mean, clearly. But even though Starfleet ships had offensive and defensive capabilities, they all had to be used in the war out of necessity. I don't know, maybe in 20 years, Starfleet changed so much that it just said, let's make a fleet of nothing but one uniform type of warship. Fuck it. My guess is that the show was cutting costs by using one model, and they thought that the crying internet bots wouldn't notice. I'm sorry, did I say Russian bots purchased by CBS to post fake comments of praise? I meant to say real people. I keep screwing that up for some reason. So anyway, it's come to this, and I'm shocked there wasn't a huge battle. I mean, there kind of was with the flowers, but it wasn't very exciting. Then Riker literally says, I'm going to kick your ass. Nothing would make me happier than you giving me an excuse to kick your treacherous Talsiar ass. Uh... I don't even know what to say about that. It makes total sense that you're angry. And then Commodore O just gives up and leaves. Now you'd think considering the dire consequence, aka the total destruction of all life in the universe, and having this exact moment been the culmination of her entire life as a secret spy. At last, our great work is nearly at an end. She might have said, fuck it, let's fight. I mean, the synth compound was literally only one house in California. General, they appear to be concentrated in one settlement. They even say it. How possible would it have been for just one Romulan disruptor beam to slip through the battle and blow up the whole synth house? 
The house has been obliterated. But uh, I guess she leaves. Maybe it's just to save her own ass. What a dedicated super secret organization. So at the end of this confrontation, Picard says, I've got, got it, it from, from here. here. And then instantly the Federation ships all leave. All of them. Shouldn't they have like waited an hour or two? What's to stop the Romulan fleet from instantly returning when they see all the Federation ships are gone? So warp right back there. Drop a bomb on the house. The house has been obliterated. Now I couldn't bring myself to do it before, but I think I'm gonna have to finally talk about it. The sex toy. Now here's where things really got lazy. Or weird or terrible, I'm not sure. I wish I could say that this thing was set up way earlier in the series, or they spent an entire episode about where they got this magical MacGuffin, or who made it, or how they fought hard to get it, steal it, trade for it. But nope, it slapped in earlier in literally the same episode. So Raffi gets this thing from an android to help fix the ship. He fixes things. The android tells her to use her imagination. You have to use your imagination. So we're to guess that this is some kind of weird alien magical device that's beyond our understanding? And that we could use our mind's eye to magically fix things or, or do anything? Ringo puts the device on his hand and turns the vibrator on and says, fix my ship. Then I guess instead of putting it back into a safe place, he randomly leaves it on the control station for anyone to find later. And what do you know, Agnes finds it. Conveniently, right after Picard says the only way to stall the Romulans is to make their ship look like they have a hundred ships. To that, Agnes says... If only we had some kind of wacky fundamental field replicator with a neuroatomic interface. So her big shit-eating grin is to imply that somehow she knows what this device is and how to use it? Okay. That's, that's weird for a lady who's never been to space before. Space turns out to be super boring. Go figure. What were you expecting? But I guess she's heard of this and knows how to use it. Eh, who am I to argue that this Harry Potter sex toy isn't pretty common knowledge? So now that the Romulans have killed all the space flowers, this diversion by Agnes and the sex toy hold off the Romulan fleet from attacking for exactly one minute and 19 seconds until Starfleet finally shows up. Now Commodore O told all 200 plus warbirds to target the Abomination's nest with Planet Sterilization Pattern 5. Ready Planetary Sterilization Pattern Number 5. Okay. So like even though the Romulan weapons were firing all willy-nilly like just a minute ago, when she calls for Planet Sterilization Pattern 5, it takes all this time to charge everything up. I mean, come on, you're just blowing up a moderately sized house in Southern California. The house has been obliterated. Do you really need sterilization pattern five? I think a number three would do just fine. Or even a two for Christ's sake. Or how about she just yells, ignore all opposition, all warbirds fire at will on the planet. We must blow up the synth compound at all costs. What's with all this pointless doomsday weapon buildup shit? Sterilize the entire planet. The house has been obliterated. Oh, I know, because it's terrible writing. Can you even credit these people as writers? How about barfers? Slappers or poopers? I don't even know anymore. I'm so embarrassed for everyone involved in this train wreck. At least train wrecks have a purpose. At least some people found this show's ending emotional. It's all they talk about. The cheap emotional scene with Data. Oh, did I say people? I meant bots. Kind of ironic, isn't it? The show's biggest fans are robots impersonating people. Uh, listen, I mean, just for what it's worth, as somebody who's in the audience, uh, who is invested in it, um, I'm loving it. It's great. Number five questions. So I tried to cover this show as best as I could without making this video 500 hours long. This show leaves you with so many more questions than answers. But it doesn't matter. It moves along at warp speed, with pieces of it falling off along the way. As long as you could make it to the end to watch the tear-jerking scene of Data asking Picard to kill him, 
You'll be okay. You'll cry. You'll have so many emotions. Not me. I got questions. Hit it, Johnny. How do you kill an android by simply stabbing it in the eye? Remember this? Or this? Or this? Data! Why did Picard ask her about her necklace? That's an unusual necklace. Was it because she was futzing with it? How convenient for the plot. Why does Narek ask her about her necklace? That's nice. Your necklace. Because she keeps futzing with it? How convenient for the plot. How exactly does an android perform a mind meld? Sutra's always had a passion for Vulcan culture. She oh, okay, okay. Okay, Sutra's really into Vulcan stuff. She read a lot of books. That eh, makes sense then. Okay, she, she learned from a book how to do a mind meld. Hey, that's no fair. That's different. Not bad. Soji says she knows about the Shaynor. You were on board the Imperial scout ship Shaynor with 25 other passengers. The Romulan ship that was assimilated by the Borg. How do you know that? The ship that broke the cube because it assimilated the knowledge of the admonition. How did Soji know about that if she wasn't part Borg? I would have said that I'd never even heard of the Shaynor or that Ramda was on it. Did Maddox somehow know this highly classified information and put it into her brain? This little thing was never answered. Forget about it. If Maddox was trying to hide, why did he implant fake memories into Soji that gave away his real location? You know, what he did 37 months ago? Probable age, 37 months. Why didn't he give her fake memories? You know, maybe growing up in Chicago, 1060 West Addison. You know how to mislead people? What happened to Narek? Last we saw him was during the soccer ball attack. Did they leave him with the androids to get murdered? Did he get beamed aboard a Romulan ship? Guess we'll have to wait for season two. Who or what was Soji's mother? If Data were to make a painting entitled Daughter, why wouldn't he paint LOL? And not some random face from his imagination. After they, including Sung and the Synth's leader, discovered that Sutra really is the one that killed the other Synth and not Narek. You reasoned correctly that your fellow Synthetics needed persuading, an emotional jolt to drive them to the decision you wanted them to make. Why don't they all just tell the other androids that she betrayed them? And instead they all jump out and go forward with their soccer ball plan. Which includes kicking and punching physically superior androids in the face. And from what I recall, that doesn't work so well. Why is the location of 10 Forward in Picard's dream not where 10 Forward is? 10 Forward is located on deck 10. Forward. Like the exact front of the ship. Did they not know that's why they call it 10 Forward? Oh, who am I kidding? Of course they didn't. When Dodge exploded, Picard got thrown back and possibly concussed. He's 150 years old. Why was he not taken to a hospital? Why does this guy sound like he's about to take these people on a Disneyland tour? Morning and welcome to Pop Cycle. What kind of Romulans say good morning? Please keep your hands inside the cart at all times. If Romulans have shown that they could beam into a room and surprise people instantly to kill or attack them, then why did the Romulans come into Picard's house one at a time through the door? I guess you're gonna tell me that Picard's house has some kind of shield over it. Shields up! Remember scans to max! They killed the alarm! Take him! Then why didn't his dog bark at them? If you were dangerous then... Number one would let me know. And let's do the fuck. They killed the alarm. Take him. If they could put Picard's brain into an android brain, then why did they have to store data onto disco flash drives? In fact, how were they able to preserve data's consciousness? His theory was that data's entire code, even his memories, could be reconstituted from a single positronic neuron. Uh, what? An essence of him essence, yes. would be alive. How the fuck does this shit work? Shouldn't they have a coming and going area? 
you know, like the subway. What happens if you walk into the thingy at the same time someone is coming out? Do you get too vexed? I mean, okay, it's kind of neat that transporters have evolved into this quicker method of travel, but the production design on this is way too illogical and nonsensical. When the Borgs flew out into space, Seven of Nine was so upset. Doesn't she know that Borgs can survive in space? Hey, that security camera footage looks an awful lot like the actual clip from the show. How lazy and embarrassing. I mean, what? They could have... Uh, oh. Silence! Oh. Silence! That's fine. Um, let's move on. Nothing to see here. Picard is different now. And Star Trek is different now. Now, I'll acknowledge a few things that I didn't put into this review. I tried to just discuss this show on its merits alone. The writing and the story, the terrible choices they made, the style, etc. The, the, the story you told this season, how you view it as a, as a mirror or a lens to look at what's happening in the world right now. Disgusting thing. Um, they get the fog inside uh, them, there is no coming back. No matter what they think, defiled is what you are, damned, cursed. I did not want to get into the whole backstory, the drama, the alleged disastrous production. What I do know is that they asked Patrick Stewart and showed him an idea and he said, pass. We have had Michael Chabon here. We have talked with Akiva Goldsman and they both tell charming stories about what a hard pitch it was to convince you to put Jean-Luc back on. Mm -hmm. And I came back at him a second time and said, tell us what you want to do. Was there anything coming to this project that you were like, I don't want to do this as Picard, or there's the, I don't want to see this in his story? And he was like, okay, no Star Trek Enterprise. I'm not the captain. None of that annoying Star Trek talk. I did strongly make the point that I did not want to be in a uniform mm -hmm. at all. Make it nothing like Star Trek at all. Let's make it about Brexit. Because that's the most important thing in the world, right? The wrong side of Brexit. It's happened. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be horrendous. To everyone? This will sound pompous, but I, in a way, I think the world needs Star Trek right now. No one will be talking about anything else in 2020, right? How about you make me Space Jesus that saves the universe? I love myself. And of course, you can't have Star Trek Picard without Picard. So everybody said, sure. And kissed his filthy old ass. And he's the most generous, the most giving, the most grounded. I mean, he elevates all of us. It's just a, a gift, it is. I had, I had only watched Star Wars. I'd never watched Star Trek at all. How Don't. much Voyager did you Don't. watch, by the way? Uh, <laughs> That's so <laughs> unkind. Did you watch Next Generation before you went into Voyager? So, um, to answer your question... <laughs> My future advice that no one will listen to is this. When they launched Star Trek The Next Generation, it was from the mind of one man. Who cast actors to fill roles and writers to write the scripts. Don't let the actors run the show or tell the creatives what to do. I understand you are an executive producer on the show. It had one huge advantage, which was the writer's room. It's the best place to be. Well, I had never been there before. Um, I knew what happened in it, and yeah. I saw the end results. Actors are generally uncreative people for the most part. I mean, there's some exceptions. If they have the clout, they'll make a show about how they're a tortured space Jesus who is selfless and worshipped for saving the galaxy. You see, actors become actors because they love themselves, and they love to hear themselves talk. They love attention, they think they're important, and they want the world to know how talented and amazing they are. Oh god, I guess you better not make Star Trek Kirk. Cancelled due to coronavirus! Number six, to conclude. I can't watch this shit anymore. It's all just so sad that this is the legacy of Star Trek The Next Generation. One of the best shows ever made. In my opinion, all the wrong people were put in charge of new Star Trek. They all seem so disconnected, smug, and generally stupid. It's the story of Picard. It is the title. Uh, it is his character journey that is the actual journey of our show. 
um, and we get to take the time to do it, which is not to say we're without plot or many things blowing up now and then. I get this feeling that they have disdain for the older Star Trek audience and want to shake things up. It literally sickens me. I mean, Deep Space Nine wanted to shake things up, so to speak, but they did it in an intelligent way, telling smart science fiction stories with morality lessons. Would one of you mind telling us what's going on? This settlement was founded by the crew of a Starfleet vessel that crashed on this planet two centuries ago. I realize this is going to be hard for you to accept, but that ship was the Defiant. Two days from now, when you leave here, you will be thrown back in time 200 years. You'll be stranded here and become the founders of this settlement. We are your descendants. Praying over your own grave. It's gotta be a new one. You can't argue that any of this trash is smart. It's literally junk. It's a dumpster fire. Aside from Star Trek being, for the most part, episodic stories, it was also a show that showed the best side of humanity in the future. Sure, there was some violence and some horrible things happen. There are some bad people on the good guy's side. Admiral, I'm hereby charging you with violation of the Treaty of Algeron. As captain of the Enterprise, I'm placing you under arrest, Mr. Wolf. And not everyone was perfect, but our heroes were. We could always count on them. Kirk, Picard, Cisco, Janeway, Archer. They were role models because they always strived to make the best decision possible or do the right thing when it wasn't always the easiest choice. They were role models because we looked to them to make a moral decision. Ah, oh, well, now we're all a little less secure in our moral certitude. To lead a team of people out of a sticky situation, to solve a problem, or debate a moral quandary. With Star Trek Picard, there's literally nothing to get out of it. It's kind of a muddled mess of what the message is. It feels like more of a random role-playing adventure game where everybody shoots at each other, or drinks booze, and is angry. The world of Star Trek was always a world you used to want to live in. People made their own Star Trek bridges, dressed up in the uniforms, Created 3D computer renderings of the inside of the Enterprise. Transformed their homes into Star Trek homes. Their cars into shuttlecrafts. There's even the Star Trek original series set tour that faithfully recreates the old Enterprise. I can't imagine anyone ever wanting to live in this dreary, dark, and nihilistic world. Fundamentally, maybe characters on a starship discussing how to get out of a space problem doesn't make for the most dramatic or contemporary television, but I assure you there's a lot of people out there that still want that. There can't possibly be enough bots, I mean people, non-Star Trek fans that really enjoy this shit to make it sustainable. I propose a second challenge to CBS. First challenge is make Picard gay. Second challenge is show us your numbers. I want to know how many individual users watched this trash show. Or how quickly the audience dropped off after a few episodes. Lastly, my analogy for new Star Trek is this. The father of a household spent decades down in the basement meticulously building a train set. He spent time hand painting the little figures, putting together each model by hand, placing each miniature fake tree, road sign, water tower, and an individual piece of grass until he had his creation. Then his 12-year-old son and his friends came downstairs and trashed it while he's away. Or in the case of Star Trek Picard, grown adults with the intellects of children. They put fireworks on the tracks, ripped the trees out, threw the trains on the floor, and then shit on everything and spilled beer all over it. Maybe they even took a can of red spray paint and painted an anarchy sign on the table too. This is what the four horse people of the apocalypse have done to Star Trek. I'm sure I'm probably being overly dramatic. And I'm certainly not trying to be a gatekeeper. More of a key master. Go back and watch the original series. TNG, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and even Enterprise. 
Sure, some of the episodes won't be that great, but that's okay. Watch them all. But watch them on Blu-ray or DVD. CBS All Access doesn't need more allowance money to buy fireworks and pot and beer for its teenagers making their TV show. Cut them off. Watch something else. Now, everyone, I'm going to leave you on a less depressing note. I'll let these guys and gals do their thing. Hit it, Johnny. Second start of the ride. And straight on till morning. Set a course. We're home. I'm reading an ion storm on that trajectory, sir. Should I go around it? We can't be afraid of the wind, Ensign. Take us to warp four. It is the unknown that defines our existence. We are constantly searching, not just for answers to our questions, but for new questions. We are explorers. We explore our lives day by day. And we explore the galaxy, trying to expand the boundaries of our knowledge. And that is why I am here. Not to conquer you with weapons, but with ideas but to coexist and learn. Let's see what's out there. Engage. Shut the fuck up. Phaser to my head and get it over with. That's when he put the phaser in his mouth and pulled the trigger.